in circumstances, in relationships, in our minds. Lord, I pray, Lord God, may your kingdom come and your will be done right now on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we invite that. Amen, 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 amen. You guys may, y'all may grab a seat. Whew. If you're newer to the church and uh, in recent weeks, I'm Freddie. I'm the senior pastor of the church and glad to be with you. I've been in San Antonio recently and in Illinois and I've been around. Someone said to me this morning, they said, man, you're like a ghost. You kind of like float in and out. So I was like, well, just know I'm always somewhere. So uh, uh, wherever I'm at, you're with me. So in fact, I, I always, I, I'm so glad to be home and, and I, I have Hampton, city on my chest, Hampton. Because uh, wherever I go, you're on my heart, so you're on my chest. Amen. So uh, anyway, uh, that's not what I'm preaching about. Last week, something happened. Uh, Pastor James was preaching a powerful word about just the power of God and the idea of it's time to move. It's time to move. It's time to move. And, and, and he had Chad and Brian help him demonstrate this idea of movement and this idea of, of the power, what happens when the power of God shows up. And we're walking, if you're new to our church, maybe you've been with us, you know we're walking through the book of Acts and we're studying the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. Uh, the Acts is, is where, Acts is where the church is birthed. And today we're actually going to study the very first time the word church actually even shows up in the Bible. It's the word ecclesia in the Greek, and we're going to study that today. Uh, but what I want to talk about, while you guys were here learning about it's time to move and learning about power, I was getting a whole new appreciation for power. I was in Chicago last week, and I had nothing to do with church uh, where I learned my lesson, and I would like to invite you into my lesson that I learned. I learned that with, comp with power comes, uh, comes, comes responsibility. Amen? I'll be 45 this summer. I know I don't look a day over 21. Uh, and I've learned that it's not time to try new things. Last week I was in Illinois and they had a vacation Bible school happening at Pastor Scott's church. And as I was there, I noticed that there were these, we were walking out and there was two motorcycles. And I asked a friend of mine, Kenny, that I had just finished meeting with, I said, what are those? He said, those, they brought those motorcycles because the campus is so big up there that they had these motorcycles so that the, the, the leaders could run supplies out to the field where the kids were doing games. Well, the thing is, all the kids were in the sanctuary for the closing ceremony. And all the adults were in the sanctuary for the closing ceremony. All the responsible people were in the sanctuary for the closed ceremony. Me and Kenny were outside and there was no one around but there was these two motorcycles. He said, do you ride? I said, I've ridden before. I have a motorcycle license. He said, have you ever ridden a dirt bike? I said, no, I have not. I said, let's go. So we jumped on these dirt bikes. We get out into the field and I decided for whatever reason that this would be a good opportunity to learn how to ride a wheelie on a, a, a motorcycle. And as we're out there by ourselves trying to videotape each other ride. Now, Kenny's a very experienced rider. I didn't tell him that I was not. He said, let's record each other doing wheelies on these motorcycles. I said, that's a great idea. Alejandro walks up and he said, hey, guys, what are you all doing? I said, well, we're trying to, I'm trying to learn how to ride a wheelie. He said, you just got to give it more gas. Look at your neighbor and say, don't give it more gas. Roll the video. That's Kenny. There's Kenny. Look at that. Now he's just showing off. Ready. There's me. Go, go, go. See that little baby? Kenny. Freddy. Look at that. Look at that baby. <laughs> Kenny. You got it. You're almost there. You just got to give it more gas. Some godly advice. <laughs> All right, raise your hand if you think this ends well. Raise your hand if you think it does not end well. All right, let's just, let's just see what happens when you don't respect the power. So that is actually not 100% accurate. Um, power. With power comes responsibility. Appreciate the power. Or the very power that could get you somewhere might get you somewhere you don't want to be. 
I got up, and my hand was twice the size of normal. I think I might have broke something in my, my hand here. Kids, listen to your parents when they say don't do dumb stuff. Mom, I'm sorry. I was supposed to tell you to close your eyes and not watch that video. You would have thought all these years that you, I finally learned to stop doing that, right, Mom? Okay, anyway, moving on. I should have learned from the jet ski. I should have learned from the, okay, that's a, okay. Power. With power, there's a reason they tell you, and just for the record, uh, no laws were violated. Illinois is not a helmet, uh, a non-helmet state. Just want to clarify that. But I will tell you, I got up different. I got up wounded. I got up, uh, uh, my, my, my hand was hurting, but my, my pride was wounded. And I still had to get up and preach that weekend. So I got up and preached with, with a broken, I, I don't know, I never went and got an x-ray. I got it prayed for, though. So it's, it's almost back to normal, praise God. So, yes, amen, amen, amen. Got a new little scar here. Yeah, good times. Uh, just a reminder to, to respect the power. We're learning about the power of the Holy Spirit. We're learning about the power of the, of, of the move of God, the power of the potential of the church. And what I would like to say is this is why we do overflow nights. Because if we're not careful with power, we might find ourselves in a place that God did not intend. So there's a lot in here about not just the power that God has brought, but the power of the spiritual forces at work. But, but the reason we need to understand them is so that we don't misapply the very things of God and find ourselves in broken situations that we didn't ever intend to be in. Power. We're going to talk today about power, and we're going to talk about persistence. So look at your neighbor, one person, look at one way, and just say power. Now look the other way and say persistence. Now, I know you just looked at the back of a bunch of other people's heads, but hopefully this will leak in. So we're going to not pick up where we left off because we're going to skip chapter 4. Two weeks from now, we will return to chapter 4. We're going to go to Acts chapter 5. We're going to read from, we're going to study from Acts chapter 5 verse 1 through the beginning of Acts chapter 6 today. See, James gets up. Last week, he preaches like four verses. I get up, they ask me to preach two chapters. Praise the Lord. 11? 11 verses. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Praise God. Next week he'll get up and preach four verses. I don't know. We'll see. I asked, I said, James, how come you only had to preach 11 verses? I get two chapters. He said, because I was in sermon prep and you were not. <laughs> and not only that, but I get to jump right into one of the most controversial passages in the entire New Testament. So strap on your seatbelt, as Pastor Bartle says, put on your seatbelt. I promise it's going to be good. But let's pick up Acts chapter 5. One through 11 as we talk about power and persistence. Well, before we do that, I forgot to do this last night too. I'm going to do it today. When you get to Acts chapter 4, you're going to read that the church was being birthed. And at the birth of the church, people were selling all they had, and they were laying it at the apostles' feet. And they, completely under compulsion of the Spirit of God, by invitation, were selling everything and giving everything to live in community so that nobody had need. It wasn't forced. It, wasn't, it was, it was a, a chosen fellowship of believers that said, we want to make sure everybody's cared for, and we trust y'all to do this. Okay, so that's the background. Are you with me? It wasn't required. It wasn't a prescription for the church. It was a description of a move of God that happened in this moment. Are you with me? So that's the background. People were like, here, I give it all, and I trust, and I'm ready to just be part of this community of sharing. Now, with that in mind, we need to go to Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land. Did it not belong to you before it was sold? L look at this, guys. This is important. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? You could have done whatever you wanted to do with that money. Okay? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. Power. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Yep, that's in the Bible. Yep, I got to preach it. I get to. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out to be buried. And buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. 
Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard these events. All right, if the ushers would come forward with the offering <laughs> plates. <laughs> That's a horrible joke. But some of y'all laughed a little too hard. We don't have ushers and offering plate. We have ushers, but we have. what just happened? I don't know what your, your church experience has been like, but I've been in spaces and environments where this was the text that was used to talk about the, our posture towards giving to the house of God. And it was painted in this portrait of fear and intimidation. You better do everything God asks you to do. You better give God everything he's commanding of you or else. See, we're a church of invitation, not obligation. So it's very important what we do with this text because it has a tremendous implication about the power of what is actually going on in this experience here. And, and the problem with assigning this, as uh, using this as a sermon about giving, is that that's not the point of the sermon. The sermon, the, I mean, the point of the message, the message here was not about, it, it wasn't about the amount, it was about the motive. And I want to talk about that because it's really important. Look at verse 4 again. In verse 4 it says what? Did it not belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? You know what he's saying? God didn't make you do this. God wasn't making you or requiring you. This isn't about them, 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 what they didn't give versus what they did give. It's about why they were doing what they were doing. And I want to lean further in if we could because this is not something you can just skip past. Let's just ask the question. Did God kill Ananias and Sapphira? Because it seems to be the implication, and I've heard that preached. I've actually learned that in, in seminary. I mean, seminary. When I, when I was getting my BS in religion, that's a true story. I got a bachelor's of science in religion. Thank you, James. My master's in seminary. I went to a seminary that was wired to teach me that, that, that somehow God stretched out his hand to destroy these people because of disobedience. And I started, I had a problem with that. Because, you know, in the entire New Testament, you don't see a pattern. You see in the Old Testament, God putting his judge, extending his hand of judgment against humanity. But then you see at the cross, God taking that wrath and putting it on Jesus. He, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. That's Isaiah 53. We all like sheep have gone astray and turned to our own wicked way. But God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's a prophecy from Isaiah 53 that was fulfilled at the cross. And after the cross, you do not see a pattern of God plucking people off the earth. You don't see a pattern. He, he, Jesus paid for the wrath of God. In fact, in the entire New Testament, there's only one other time that you're going to see, I think it's Acts chapter 10 or Acts chapter 12, I've already forgot, uh, or, where you're going to read about King Herod. And, and it says in that passage, the angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness. That's the only place in the entire New Testament where you see something like that. So what is really going on here, and what does it say about the power that is at work? Let's go back to Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that who? Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart? So who has filled his heart? And the word fill is fascinating here. It's the word plerajo uh, in, in Greek. And it, it literally means this, to cram. To cram like a fishing net that is so full another fish can't fit in it. How has Satan so crammed, filled your heart that there's no room for anything else in your heart other than Satan? It actually goes further. It's to execute an office or to finish a task. This is the Greek word that, that Peter uses here. How have you allowed Satan to execute the office of your heart? How have you allowed Satan to so fill your heart that he's going to finish the task? 
How is it, this is, this is uh, the overall, the summary of this Greek word, to complete, to end, to expire, and to fill. How has Satan so crammed full, completely ended, and expired your heart? Ananias and Sapphira have given their heart fully to the work of Satan. At least that's what the apostle Peter discerned, the same guy who knew that they were not telling the truth. See, see, the Spirit of God has a way of revealing things, and, and, and he's asking, he's like, why did you let that happen? Why? Because what does the Bible say about Satan? Well, Jesus had a lot to say about the devil. Look at John 8, verse 44. Let's look at the words of our Savior. He's talking to some religious leaders who are trying to manipulate the people, and this is what Jesus says to the, to the church leaders. He says, he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. What does he say about the devil? He was a murderer from the beginning. A what? From the beginning. And holding, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. <laughs> when he lies, he speaks his native language. It's like a, a, like, a, like a rap battle. It's like, like Jesus has bars. It's like, he's like, for he is a liar and the father of lies. There's no room for confusion here. But if you need more clarity, go to John 10.10. 10. Jesus is talking about his ministry. Look at the contrast. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have, this is Jesus talking, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Was Ananias experiencing life to the full? Or did he experience the steal, kill, and destroy. Right? And, 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 and then Sapphira shows up, and Peter is not make, pronouncing judgment. He's making observation. He's saying, look, I know what happened before because y'all have given yourselves to the father of lies who comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. He's been a murderer since the beginning. He's a murderer now. He just murdered your husband. What do you think he's going to do to you? There's, there's some serious power at work. Not just on the, the right side, but on the wrong side. Careful who you give real estate to in your life. Because the father of lies shows up and says, I just want a little bit. I just want a little bit more. I just want a little bit more. And there's a generation out there that is being told through music, told through movies, told through social media, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And the father of lies is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And I can't think of a more important time in the history of our planet than now for godly men and women to rise up with the power that we heard about last week, the power of the Spirit of God, that we could go up and say, you don't have to lay there. You don't have to be mentally and emotionally and psychologically crippled. You don't have to be physically ill. But I, we've been sent with a power and authority that's not ours, but it's been given to us. A power that is not derived by, by our, our ability to articulate, but our obedience to surrender to the presence of God. And it's real. Lives are on the line. It's real. It's real. Jesus gives us a line in the sand. Nowhere in this passage does it say that God killed them. I want to be clear. And I challenge you to go find that. It does not say that our God stretched out his hand against them. It does say that they had given themselves fully. Their hearts were fully. I actually have a theory. This is just a theory. But my theory, I want to be clear, this is just my kind of, my one guy's theory. I think that this was a calculated plot of infiltration. That they had given their hearts to the work of Satan in the church, not realizing the power that they were playing with. They wanted the benefits of sharing the goods without actually fully sharing their goods. They wanted to take, not contribute. They would have, this would have been just the beginning of Satan's plot for them, and God exposed it. And when it got exposed, Satan no longer had use for them, so he tossed them to the side because that's what he does. This is my theory. Either, my, either maybe God did stretch out his hand, and it just doesn't tell us that. But I do know that God stretched his hand uh, to, of, of, of the punishment of our sin and put it on Jesus. I know that the scripture says that. I know that there's only one other place in the New Testament where we see the spirit, uh, the angel of the Lord stretching out to cause sickness, which ends up in death. And that's 
later in the book of Acts. That's what I know. So I, I don't know what I don't know, but I do know what I do know. And I don't know always what I do know, and I do know that I don't know. <laughs> anyway, the point is there's power in spiritual forces at work in the move of God. Don't play around with the devil. But we have more power in the presence of God. Don't try to play with his people either. Acts 5, verse 11. Let's go back and see that one more time. Y'all doing all right? Great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about those, these events. This is a fascinating passage right here. Great fear sees the whole church. Did God bring you here today to terrify you? Hallelujah. I've been in that church. Man, scared at the altar, crying. God, don't smite me. The problem with that approach to Christianity is when the fear wears off, so does the obedience. So let's talk about this word fear. It's the word, uh, first, actually, let me, let me highlight this. This is the, this 5 verse 11, that word church, this is the first time that that word shows up in the Bible. It's the word ecclesia, and it means those who've been called out. The, call, the assembly of the called out ones. God has drawn a clear line in the sand. He said there's really powerful forces at work. Which team do you want to play for? But don't play for the wrong team and try to come into this squad because God actually has a vested interest in his people. He will expose these things. And the first time the word church shows up is after Ananias. This whole weird passage, it's the first time we read about those who've been called out, the assembly. Why? Because we need to assemble together, right? We need to assemble because you have gifts I don't have and you have strength I don't have and we need each other. So there's an assembly of those who've been called out. We've been called forth. I cannot think of a better time, a more important time for those who have been called out to step out. And it says fear, fear, this word fear. I got, I got the Greek for this word too. And go study all of this. It's, it's awesome to do your own studying of Scripture. The word fear is the Greek word phobos. And it says great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about these events. So there's two groups of people dealing with this one word. What's fascinating is this word has two meanings. This word simultaneously has two meanings. Phobos means terror. It's fear, dread, or terror. Okay, so all who heard realized you don't play around with those people. You don't, the way we used to say uh, in the 90s, you don't perpetrate <laughs> like you're trying to be a part of a collective just so you can collect when you're holding back. You don't show up to try to take, steal, because that's the thief who comes to th steal kill and destroy. But what about the people of God? Were they walking around like, man, we better not mess with Peter because we might fall dead. You saw what, you, you saw what happened when Ananias says, don't, don't play around. I don't even want to be around Peter. I don't want, I don't want him looking at me like, ah, oh, the Lord has told me. <laughs> so the other way, the same word is translated, phobos, it means fear, dread, or terror. So those who heard about it, this is how the other way, the other meaning of this word at the same time. This is fascinating to me. Reverence for one's husband. Reverence, go study this. Reverence for one's husband. There's two, way, two meanings to this one word. Reverence for one's husband or fear and shock and terror. Can we agree that those are very different things? When I show up, I don't say, hey, Jen. And she has fear, shock, and terror, if anything. <laughs> but she has, we, she has reverence towards me. Now, I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible teaches me that the church is the bride of Christ. So at the same time, those who are on the outside can say, those are people you don't mess with, while those who are on the inside can say, man, I have respect for my God because we are his bride, and he actually cares about us, and he's actually with us, and he's actually got us, and so this reverence is building up in me, and I know that the power that I've been invited to comes with responsibility, so I don't want to be reckless and careless and, and knock things over, but I'm going to honor the power, but I'm going to demonstrate some perspective. 
persistence because I've been called out. So you see how all these are kind of weaving together. And all of a sudden you go a little bit further and it says that there's this, there's, this, there's this fear among the community, but they don't want to mess with these folks. But then within the church, something else has happened. Let's go to Acts chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. 12, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. So now everybody knows where the church meets. They're meeting at the park. They're meeting outside. They were meeting in homes. They would get together in the temple court. But now they are in a prominent place in the city. They are meeting in Solomon's colonnade. They are the called out ones. And they say, we don't mind meeting in Peninsula Town Center because we want everybody to know that when we're here, the presence of God is moving and you're all invited. But there is a line in the sand. No one, look at verse 13, no one else dared join them even though they were highly, highly regarded by the people. That's a, that's a tense scripture, isn't it? In, in a generation that's talking about church growth. How do you get the church to grow? Maybe that's not our responsibility. Maybe our responsibility is to be the church. And we'll let God deal with the hearts of humanity. And all of a sudden... People are like, hey, look, I, I, I heard about some stuff going on over there. And if you're not serving their God, you better not show up like you are because that gets exposed real quick around those people. However, if that's where the chapter ended, that would feel a little bit like, what is God doing? Now let's go to the next verse because I want you to see what happens when there's perseverance in the called out ones. When the world actually can take notice. They can move from a fear of the power of God to a desire to be part of the family. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. How are both of those things true? Because the church stepped up as the people of God, demonstrated the power of God, in the presence of God, with the persistence of God, and all of the people around them saw there's something very different about how these people live. I can't just show up pretending I'm in and not being in, but man, I want to be in. There's a clear line. And more and more people stepped across it. More and more people said, I don't need the church to look more like me. I need to look more like the church. Nevertheless, I love that word. Let's go to verse 15 and 16. Y'all doing okay? Verse 15 and 16. As a result, the people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and the mats so that at least... Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits. And what? What does it say? And, and all of them were healed. Now what's crazy about this is this whole shadow thing. They were like, maybe if Peter's shadow would just hit us, then we'll, wow, that man's got power. And, and so this was a cultural thing. See, see, among the Hebrew people at the time of, of, of Jesus, people had this idea, there was this, this, this kind of mythology that if an evil person's shadow hit you, evil would enter your household. So shadows were a big deal to them. Now somewhere somebody came up with the idea, wait, if evil be, can be transferred through shadows, maybe this power can be transferred through shadows too. This is not... A biblical concept. I want to be clear. We don't have a bunch of lights casting like shadows of, of people around the church so that maybe somebody will get hit with it and be like, ooh, I, got, I, I can preach now. If so, I'd put a big spotlight behind Brian and I'd be like, hit me with the glory of being able to sing a note on key. Praise God. That's not biblical. This is descriptive of what a people believed and how God actually met them in that belief. This is not a recipe for ministry. We don't have to walk around with a flashlight behind us so that God can work through us. The problem is when we take one scripture and we turn it into some crazy weird theology and we start trying to chase it. This was actually God honoring other people's desire to connect with him in a way that they thought they understood him. And God in his grace met them right where they were. Isn't that fascinating? I think it's fascinating that if you were actually trying to go after God, it might seem weird. You might have heard something and you thought something. God's going to meet you in there. That doesn't mean the church should start a shadow ministry. 
it does mean that we should be have our doors open to anybody who's hungering and thirsting for God and say, you are welcome here regardless of your presuppositions, regardless of your superstitions. We're, we're going to teach you the word of God so that you can be changed by the power of God. God honors those who are going after him. So my first point <laughs> at the end of my sermon, my first closing, pruning comes, from pruning comes power. From pruning comes power. There was a clear line drawn, but a clear people stepped forward. I spent most of the message talking content. Now I'm going to spend 35 seconds times eight um, for the note takers. First note, from pruning comes power. Let's shift gears. We've talked about the idea of power. Let's talk about persistence. Let's go back. Let's go through the rest of these verses. Acts chapter 5, 17 and 18. 17 and 18 says this. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees, the ruling body of the religious people of, of Jerusalem, they were filled with jealousy. And they arrested the apostles and they put them in, pu in public jail. They put them in the public jail. General population. They put them in a holding tank. <laughs> From power comes persecution. To pruning comes power. We all like the power, but what about the persecution? Don't be surprised when you start doing things for God and very real forces who do not want you to do things for God show up to try to deter that from happening. I heard a preacher say a long time ago, if you're not facing opposition from the devil, it might be because you and him are going the same direction. Let me get back to the text. Verse 19, 20. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the door of the jail and brought them out. Look what the angel said. Go home and be a little bit more quiet about your faith so you don't get back in jail. God doesn't like having to send us down here to get y'all out of jail. <laughs> no. Go stand in the temple court, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. The reason God got them out of jail was so they could go right back in persisting in doing what God had told them to do. How cool is that when God is your bail bondsman? How awesome is that? And that's exactly what they did. They went right back out there in the morning. The Sanhedrin wakes up. The religious leaders go to inquire of them. And they're like, yeah, they're not here. And what, do you, what do you mean they're not here? They're not here. Who let them out? We don't know. Who posted their bond? We don't know. We came to feed them breakfast. They're not here. Where are they? I got a pretty good idea. There's a crowd out there. And there they are talking all about this new life. And they're like, what are we going to do? they literally like, we don't know what to do with these people because they're so crazy about this God that it's so filled them with power, we don't know how to shut them up. What a great problem to have. And so they're like, they're exasperated. They're trying to sort it all out. Um, they say, look, you guys got to calm down with this. You're a little too radical with your faith. And look at verse 29. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. A line had been drawn. They had been called out. They had been filled with the power of God. And they, they basically saying, we don't care what prison you put us in. You can't stop the gospel. We don't care about persecution. Because, because we're going to keep moving forward. From persecution comes persistence. Let me, let me pause real quick. Uh, let's go to verse 40 and 42. Because they, they end up, like, they, they still, there's a pattern. And, it, and it's getting more intense. Let's go to verse 40. Check it out. Uh, this guy named Gamaliel tries to speak up to the Sanhedrin. He's like, hey, maybe, maybe we shouldn't stop this. Maybe we should just try to like find a different way around it. And his speech persuaded the Sanhedrin from trying to kill the, the apostles. So they called the apostles in and had them flogged. That means they were beat with sticks. They were beat up and bloodied. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin, check this out, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Wow. Day after day, in the temple court and from house to house, they never stopped preaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. These were some knuckleheads for Jesus. Like, you can't beat it out of us. You can't silence us. You can't imprison us. 
You can't flog us hard enough. If I have to get up with a broken hand and proclaim the word, I will. I shouldn't have used that comparison because that was, that was grace and stupidity, not obedience. The Lord did not call me to that motorcycle. But from persecution comes persistence. 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 When you've been through some stuff, you meet God in new ways. And when you meet God in new ways, you don't unlearn that. You don't forget that he showed up when no one else was there. The rest of your life, you realize everybody else is optional because I know my Savior in a way I didn't know him until I was all by myself. And when he was enough for me by myself, he's enough for me with everybody else. But even if they're not there with me 10 years from now, guess what? He's enough. And I wouldn't have learned that had I not been all by myself. When you've been delivered from something, nobody can convince you that God's not a deliverer. When you've been healed, no one can convince you that God can't heal. When you've been pulled out of the gutter of life and treated like family, no one can convince you that this door is not open for all people. See, this pattern of the gospel is why we're here today. Because throughout generations, the church has been persecuted. You know what happens? You would think that the devil is an idiot. Not only is he a liar. He's probably pretty intelligent in some of the stuff he does. But what I don't understand is why the devil keeps trying to do the same thing and getting the same results. Think about that. Throughout centuries, every time the church is persecuted, it spreads like wildfire. Right now, on the globe, there are places where the church is facing persecution. And do you know they're trying to figure out ways to handle all the people coming to know Jesus? People are getting thrown in jail for reading pastors, and the word of God is spreading like wildfire. Isn't that crazy? And I'm just curious when the devil's going to realize. I, oh, maybe he did. Maybe that's why we're not facing persecution. Maybe he figured out what works for America. Cultural Christianity. Oh, yeah, er, er, nobody's got a problem with Christians. Y'all just behave and be cool and get together and don't worry about everybody else. Uh-oh. Maybe it's time to wake up. Maybe it's time for this sleeping giant to wake up. Why? Acts chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, the church grew problems showed up. The 12, so there's now there's a problem. The Hellenistic Jews are complaining because the Hebraic Jews are getting, uh, the, the widows are getting more food than others. I misstated this last night. I want to apologize. There's two, two interpretations of what a, 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 a Hellenistic Jew was. Uh, one interpretation is that there were people who were not born Jewish but had chosen the Jewish faith and now came to know Jesus. So they were Gentiles who were operating according to the Jewish culture and religion, but they were not Jews by birth. But the, the other pre more prevalent interpretation is Hellenistic Jews were people who were born Jewish, but they had embraced uh, Greek culture. So they're living like Greeks, but so both are coming to know Jesus. Jews who were practicing Jews, who now found Jesus as Messiah to fulfill the old covenant, and, and people who either had embraced the Greek culture and now are coming to Jesus, or who were born outside of the Jewish uh, race, but had come to know the Jewish religion and are now coming to know Jesus. Either way, there's either culturalism or racism going on here, but it, as early as there was a church, there was division. And the Hellenistic Jews are saying, hey, their widows are getting more than our widows. We're all supposed to be sharing equally, but there's not equal dispersion. The problem was so many people were coming to faith, there were so many widows to take care of that they're like, we got to create a system for this. You know, it's a good thing when you got to create a system because of growth. And so look at how God creates systems. This is it right here. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on the tables to make sure the food is equally distributed. Look at verse 3. There. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be really good at distributing food. Who are known to be really good with organizational systems and processes. Who are really talented at solving problems. That's not what the Bible says. Do you want to know God's criteria for putting people in positions of decision and influence? Choose from among you people who are known to be full of the spirit 
and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. And what happens at this point? Let's go to verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient in the faith. A large number of priests. I, I got stuck on that word. I'm wrapping up. I promise. This is my last closing. Priests. A large number. So I studied the word, and it, and it tells me that this wasn't just the priests from the Hebrew culture. This wasn't just the Levites. This was also priests of other religions that were influential in society. But now people are taking notice because the way the world, the world chooses talent, but God's church chooses character. And, and they're looking and they're saying, those people are in charge of some stuff, but they're, they're not the ones I would have picked. God is using normal, ordinary people to do extraordinary things, and they're actually doing it better than our system. They're making sure everyone is cared for because they're listening to the Spirit and they're operating in wisdom. We're over here listening to our own agenda, operating in maneuvering and, and scheming. They're over here operating in servitude. And these influential people are saying, I want to be a part of that. Maybe the answer to what's going on in our world, in our country, starts with godly men and women stepping up and saying, Lord, I want to be filled with your spirit and your wisdom. Why don't you all stand up with me, please? My Bible tells me that you are a royal priesthood. A chosen generation. You see, from persistence comes priests. From persistence comes priests. Glance to your left real quick. Now glance to your right. You know what you just saw? A room full of priests. A royal priesthood. Influencers in the spiritual kingdom. If you're online, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. My question is, what's it going to take for all of us to live as priests? To go from pruning to power, from power to persistence, from persistence to priesthood. What nudge is God inviting you towards right now? I'm going to pray for us. And I would love to invite our prayer partners to be available. And I'd love for us to just take, we got tons of time. I'd love for us to just take plenty of time to just listen to God in this space. And my question for you is this, and I'm asking myself the same thing. Where is God stirring me right now? Where is God stirring you right now? What's the next step? We talked about it's time to move last week. My question this week is how is God inviting you to move? Is it, Lord, I surrender to your power? Lord, I will stand through this persecution. Lord, I will embrace my assignment as a priest representing you and your kingdom wherever I may find myself. If you're here today, this word was for you. If you're watching online, this word was for you. It was a divine appointment. God has, has, has created an opportunity for you and I to respond to his word. So my question is, how, how does that inform your life? If you would need help processing that, our prayer partners are available for that very reason. We have prayer partners up there. We have prayer partners over here. We have prayer partners over here. If you would like to turn to the person who, that you, who invited you and say, hey, I don't know those folks, but I know you. Would you pray for me? Let me invite you to do that. Maybe, maybe, maybe what God is inviting you to do is so personal right now that, that he just wants you to sit down with him right where you are and just process, pull out a note on your phone or pull out your journal. I, it doesn't matter. Whatever God is nudging you towards, I just want you to be willing to be obedient to it right now. So I'm going to pray for us. Is that okay? And then we're going to worship God. And as we do, don't let this moment be missed on you. Would you drink from the well of what God is offering you in this moment? Let me pray for us. Lord, we ask right now, Lord, you've, you've given us a word, of a deposit of faith in our heart. And now, God, I ask that we as your people, your royal priesthood, would step forward to embrace the invitation you've put before us. Wherever we find ourselves starting today, may we grab hold of your presence right now. Holy Spirit, come. Would you just have your way in this time? Because when we know when you show up, God, you change things that we could never imagine. 
And we ask and invite you to do that right now in Jesus' name. Amen.